I want to make this abundantly clear. I'm not proud of this, but this is my story. A lot of the addicts I treat, that was their first drug of choice, was the Ritalin or the Adderall. My addiction started really like any other kid's story would start. It's the same story, every single case. As a wrestling coach, I've lost seven to 20 years. The progression from pills to heroin is very simple. You know, I'd gone to the hospital a couple times thinking I was having a heart attack. Was after four months of shooting dope, it was like, where does this go? This goes all the way bad. <sighs> I'm sorry, I didn't make it. I knew it was eventually gonna come, but I dreaded that phone call every day. The tenacity that an addict chases their fix, second to none. Opioids were a thousand percent overprescribed. Tell a kid that wins the nationals, you have a problem. How am I still winning? I threw him out of practice and I was like, get out. Everything that was important to me had gone. I was just sobbing my eyes out. It's a nationwide issue. It's a freight train. Honestly, I tell them all the time, this is nothing. That's the fight of your life. So this is the tunnel to Tobe. So now, right now, we're going underneath Ocean Parkway. This is where I spend every weekend day in the summer. Wow, it's nasty out. It's a bunker. I'm not gonna use the head. I think the best piece is, cut the tail off. I'm gonna show you the best piece. This is the piece that I'm gonna cut into little pieces. We'll put it through the hook and pray. All right, let's see if they'll stay put. All right, we'll let those sit for a little bit. Hopefully they bend in half. I grew up in Webster, New York. It's outside of Rochester. We grew up on a dead end gravel road with five or six acres of woods on a private land. And uh, we grew up shooting BB guns, riding dirt bikes, and a lot of outdoor shit. I started wrestling at a young age. My dad was my coach. My brother was one of my wrestling partners. and. Uh, I remember very vividly, we were watching the NCAAs on our basement TV, and I, would, I wanna say I was in fifth or sixth grade. Again, I don't know the exact time, but I, I, I wanna go to Iowa. And my dad said, if you're not a state champ, you can't go to a college like Iowa or a D1 college. And I remember him telling me that you're probably not gonna win a state title. Don't set that kind of bar for yourself. And you know, it just made me wanna just do it. I just wanted to like, I wanted to prove him wrong. And then the next year, you know, I was, I lost literally one match in my last three years of high school. And so, and I just murdered everyone my senior year. Um, teched my way through the States. It was not even a like remotely close match. He was fast, he was really good on top. You know, we were like, wow, this kid has some tools. He checked all the boxes. But I remember I like was obsessed with John Smith in Oklahoma State um, those last couple of years of high school, and I really wanted to, you know, I wanted to be at, at Oklahoma State. And I think I sent them a tape, and I filled out like the questionnaire or whatever, and I never heard back. And I was, I was really pissed off, I guess. I was pissed off because a lot of these bigger colleges weren't coming after me, and I thought I was ranked third in the country at the time. I'd placed at Fargo. Am I invisible? You know, and I think part of it was that the rumor mill had started to spin. Brett Metcalf and Dustin Schlater were the two guys ahead of me. And I think, and they were like, I think they were number one and two pound for pound. So that didn't help. I was a kid who was probably not as straight edge and as hard nosed as those two guys. I remember the Hofstra coach telling me after I'd gone and started coaching at Hofstra that we heard some bad stuff about you and we stopped recruiting you at that point. I was watching the review of, it was either the state tournament, Eastern State, some tournament. And 
He ran out and they're like, colleges you're looking at. And he, he listed Edinburgh. It might have even said, he's going to Edinburgh. And we're like, what? Before the finals, they fill the finalist sheet out. And I think part of it was like college plans. I was like, I don't know. The hell do you want me to fill out here? I don't have any. I hadn't even had a thought about where I wanted to go as a 16 year old kid in sophomore high school. And uh, the guy's like, we have to fill it out. We have to put something. It's on Empire Television or whatever it is. And the kid in front of me was a senior and had already committed to going to Edinburgh. And I looked at his and I wrote down Edinburgh. And uh, Coach Flynn had contacted either me or my dad and uh, said he wanted me to come and visit. And I remember very vividly saying, I'm not going to that hillbilly little teeny school in the middle of Pennsylvania. I'm not interested. Coach Flynn said, we'll come to you. You can do whatever you want, but I'm not going to Edinburgh. Coming down on his visit and he had like a popped up shirt and everybody's like, who's this joker? I'm like, listen, we need this joker. You know, let's, uh, let's you know, lock him down. Yeah, I got the Heelys on though today. <laughs> no rolling up and downhill for me today. I'll take it right here, sir. So what happened was I went on my visit. I don't know if this was planned, but Coach Flynn had me hang out with a couple guys that took me out and they took me to like the best party I've ever been to. And every girl was coming up to me and I was, you know, talking to every girl and they were all like super friendly and like, it was awesome. It was like the, one of my favorite party nights I can remember. And the next day I said, yep, I'm coming here. This is what I'm talking about with the party though. There was never another party like that ever at Edinburgh. I feel like that was like super staged. Like for me, you know, like we're gonna get this kid because we know he's a party here, you know? So I started drinking, I wanna say it was my ninth grade year at, uh, we actually went on a trip to the Disney Duels. A couple of the older guys got beers and you know liquor or whatever and I remember being like, this is fucking awesome. And walking down the beach with my buddy and just being like, this is the best feeling ever. As kids, we're told drugs and alcohol are gonna ruin our lives, right? Like that's what we're told in school. And what they don't tell us is the first time you get drunk that it's, you know, it's awesome. It feels good, it physically feels good. Uh, so it was New Year's Eve, we were at my friend Nick's house. We snuck a bottle of Avalanche, which was like some peppermint schnapps stuff, tasted great. Uh, I took a shot of it, I physically felt good. I, I drank a little more, I felt better. After about an hour, I got the courage to call the girl I had a crush on since the fifth grade. Turns out she had a crush back. I asked her to be my girlfriend. She said yes. I woke up the next day with a headache and a girlfriend. Didn't exactly ruin my life. We had a blast. I could do without the headache, but I had a good time, right? So instantly, everything they taught me in school about drugs and alcohol went right out the window. And then you think about it, like they're lying to us. Like our, our adults drink, like we watch them drink. We go out and after the matches or games, we're at TGI Fridays and everyone's drinking. So what are you talking about? This is bad, you know? In 10th grade, I started really probably abusing the drinking thing. Um, 11th grade, I got prescribed uh, ADHD medication, Adderall. When I got prescribed it, I loved it. I absolutely loved how it made me feel. I loved how much energy it gave me. I loved how, you know, talkative I was. I loved everything about it. All the, you know, the coming down from it was a little rough, but you know, the juice was worth the squeeze. Middle of 2000s, 2005 to 2012, like ADHD was the hot thing on the scene and everybody got prescribed Adderall, everybody got prescribed uh, Concerta, everybody got prescribed Vyvanse. If you were like a sporadic kid, that's what they did to calm you down and to focus. And you know, if you know anything about Adderall, it's an amphetamine. It literally, if you get the, the, the off-brand name, it's amphetamine salts. That's literally what it is. It's like one molecule off of meth. Everyone likes to talk about the opioid epidemic, right? That's, that's the big headline for everything, but we're seeing a huge uptick in methamphetamine use and amphetamine use. So Adderall is amphetamine and, uh, and it's leading to more methamphetamine use. I know like it's very close people to me take it and it's a, like a miracle for them. That was not the case with me. I abused it from day one and I liked it way too much. So my senior year rolls around and now the Adderall abuse has gotten way worse. Now I'm going to my doctors and asking them, hey, it's still working, but not as good. Can you up it? Yes, upped it, upped it. Hey, I think I need it twice a day because around you know two o'clock, I, I can't stay focused. Up, you know, typical addict behavior, manipulation. A lot of the addicts I treat, that was their first drug of choice, was the Ritalin or the Adderall. 
My name is David Levin. I'm the CEO and Chief Clinical Officer for Legacy Healing Center. Once I started to address my own demons and my own struggles with substance abuse, it was only natural that I would go back to school and become an addictions professional. The athletes I've worked with at Legacy uh, primarily have been baseball players, football players, uh, I've treated a couple hockey players, professional hockey players. Uh, the common theme with those patients has been that due to injuries, you know, from, from their profession, they were prescribed opioids, these painkillers, and other medications, and unfortunately became addicted to them. My addiction started really like any other kid's story would start. So I got opiates prescribed to me as a kid after my senior football season. I was a quarterback, I went to go drop back to throw a pass, and when I released, I had hit my wrist on the offensive lineman's helmet. And when I got the x-ray back from my wrist, it was completely shattered. I remember roll getting rolled out of the hospital in a wheelchair, um, and then as, as I was leaving, the doctor threw a piece of paper on my lap picked up the piece of paper and it was a script for Oxycontin. Went to the pharmacy, dropped off the prescription, got them, took them, like anything else. But I remember taking that first Oxycontin. I mean, I grew up like a super insecure kid. I wanted to not only like myself, but I wanted you to like me too. I remember taking that first pill and none of that mattered. The insecurities went away, the self-doubt went away. I, I didn't know that a white pill that was barely the size of the tip of my pinky was gonna completely alter and change my entire life. First prescription drug experience, uh, it was my sophomore year. I had to get a tooth pulled and I was given a prescription of antibiotics and a prescription of painkillers. Uh, I got to the pharmacy, we filled it, we got back to the, uh, to the wrestling room and in the locker room. I took two of these painkillers and I went out to wrestling practice and uh, the first thing I noticed is I physically felt good. The next thing I noticed is, is I have a, a whole lot of energy and I'm extremely flexible, right? I'm not a flexible guy. I've never won the physical fitness award because I couldn't pass the V-sit, but all of a sudden my hands are touching the mat. And then Coach Bo's Whistler runs sprints. I can't really feel my legs. I can run as many sprints as you want. I'm blowing everybody away. I'm winning the sprints. I just, I have like this six gear that I just found, you know? Uh, I walked out of that practice and I had one of the best wrestling practices I've ever had in my life. Uh, I found my super serum. Pole just broke. That guy's out of commission. Oh, you see, that's a horseshoe crab behind you. You just stepped on that sucker. He's dead, obviously, but these are horseshoe crab skeletons. These, uh, I forget what medical condition the blood from these helps out with. It's something like 10 grand for a pint of this blood from these. They harvest them. Obviously, you don't come out to the ocean and take the blood from them. But I believe the blood is blue, and uh, it helps cure some medical condition. But I think it's time we go freshwater because this pole is broken, and these conditions are not being friendly to us. So we'll load this up and go to the pond. All right, that's that. So going into college, um, I remember being in my freshman year and there was, at this point I started to see some negative effects from the Adderall and I didn't love how I got like very, you know, very up and then the down was starting to become worse and I didn't love that. So I remember stopping for like the first three months I was in college and then I remember getting to like the point in time where I had to certify and, and start making the weight class and I was just too heavy and I knew that it was going to be a lot easier if I started taking my Adderall again. And that's when it got back out of control. I can't tell you how many times I was up until four in the morning 
begging people to stay up and party with me, telling them I would give them, you know, some of my medication to help them stay awake. And, you know, I was a booze bully. I was a drug bully. You know, I tried to it, tried to get everyone to stay up late every night of the week with me. And I remember having to go literally to practice at 6.30 after nights like those, you know, nights it was up till four in the morning, you know, lay down, pass out for two hours and go. And I remember, um, my lifting partner at Edinburgh several times having to spot me on squats but under my armpits and go with me because I was going to fall over backwards. I was still not, not hung over. You're drunk still. He wasn't going out. He wasn't going to bars. He wasn't running around, right? Like you think of like college kids who are chasing girls and drinking beer. That wasn't him. He was sitting at home on his couch drinking. And by the way, there's only one type of drinking the way I drank, and it was blackout drinking. There was never getting a buzz and hanging out and being cool. It was always the last one at the party, the last one awake. That's just the way I did it. I mean, he's drinking 12 beers or 18 beers a night, you know? I mean, holy moly. His practices were just, you know, and he just, he didn't practice well. You know, he'd lay around and... Coach Flynn was 100% all over me pretty much the whole year about drinking too much. But the problem was twofold. One, I never got in trouble. And the other part, I'm still winning though. What's the problem? I threw him out of practice uh, right before the nationals. I was like, get out. He wasn't giving Matt Hill a good go. I was like, you gotta get out of here, man. You're doing him no good, forget you. Like I mentioned before, like the weight was always an issue at 49. It was a tough weight for me to make. Adderall definitely made it easier. I just remember not having it and I was about to go to the nationals and I knew I needed it for that week to get close to weight. And uh, again, it was okay, right? I was prescribed it. Totally okay for me to take it. I remember calling my dad and telling my dad, you know, I ran out of my script or someone stole it. I made up something, right? And he went and took care of it at the doctors for me. I just manipulated them, I worked them, and it's horrible to say that, not proud of it, but that's my story, and that's exactly what happened. And I conned my dad into getting, you know, my, my script filled for me. I was very good at taking a little holiday from the drugs. I would take my medication leading up to the days leading up to the match. You know, the 07 tournament was no different. I don't know what you want to call it. I was clean for the weekend, you know, no booze, no drugs. You know, we had a joke. If, if you walked in the practice room and looked at him, he looked like a 41 pounder. He looked like this. And then for some reason, that kid put on a singlet and he gained 50 pounds. It, we were like, holy cow. He was like, just something about crossing that line and really, really good competitor. Sal Alvarenga first round, beat him up pretty bad. Next match I had Valamont. I think I beat him 12-0. Next match, I had Jordan Lean. I beat Jordan 6-2. Honestly, I haven't never wrestled Schlater, and I'm looking forward to that. You oh, know. awesome, yeah. That awesome. was a convincing win. Yeah, thank you. Next match, I had Schlater. Everyone knows who Schlater is. King Kong at the time, you know, gonna be the next four-timer without a red shirt. This is your number one seed from Minnesota, a sophomore, Dustin Schlater, is 35 and 0 this season. He was the god at the time, you know. I think he'd lost one, he was like 85 and one. Something insane. I bet there was three people in that arena of hovering, 15,000, 20,000 people in there. I bet there was three people that would have bet on me. Coach Flynn had just drilled it into my head. You're winning the Nationals this year. You're gonna knock Dustin Schlater off. And he's like, I want to go out there and fucking take him down and show him zero respect. When I got that first double, it was just a huge confidence booster when I took him right down to his back. And I knew that when we went back to the center after I took him down, I heard the announcement over the top. Uh, that was the third time he'd been taken down all year. Um, that was, I knew that definitely gave him a blow mentally. Um, it definitely gave me a confidence booster. I thought right then I knew I had the mental edge on him. So. so I remember feeling like on top of the world after that match. So I knew I was running the matches because I knew that I only had one more match to go. So we are going to go to overtime. Okay, we start one with a one minute sudden victory one period. Good. Any good. points okay. scored by other Let's wrestler, that's nice. your winner. by Gillespie to no get points. off his head. No points. He's turned a great shot into a fighting chance.
Did I go out and party that night after I won a national title? Yeah. Um, I remember to a certain point in that night, I fucking won the tournament. I won the nationals. And it's like, tell a kid that wins the nationals that you have a problem. How am I still winning? Addiction is an obsessive and compulsive uh, maladaptive behavior, right? It's a it's a, a coping mechanism. Addiction. Uh, I, I often, when talking about addiction and relapse prevention, I talk about how, for many addicts, certain substances at first felt like medicine, but then turned into poison. When I first started realizing that this little white pill that I've been taking three times a day, there's actually some side effects when I stop taking it. Um, that's when I realized that, oh, maybe I had just crossed a line. I remember waking up one morning, the pill bottle was empty. I woke up, I was sweating, I was hot, I was cold, I was in the fetal position. I was like, I just, feels like I got like the flu. Um, I remember getting a call from my buddy who I played baseball with in high school and he was like, dude, come on over. I'm like, I'm sick, man. Like, I can't go anywhere. And he's like, dude, grab the bottle and come to my house. Well, there's no, there's no bottle left. And his response was, you're not, you're not, you don't have the flu. You're going through withdrawal. Within six months, I went from orally taking these pills as prescribed to taking them off the street and buying them off the street. When you're a high school kid and you have like a $20 a week allowance, there's only so much you can get. Um, and a $60 pill that's gonna keep you high for six hours just isn't gonna cut it anymore. Um, so the, ne the next step to that was heroin. Okay. Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. Switch it up, switch it up. Other guy, ready, set. The Hazlitt community is a blue collared, hard nose, um, but a wonderful town. You know, it's, it's not a town that you would think that there's a drug problem. The experiences that I've had, it, it's all started with pills have all led to, to heroin. Every single case, you know, it's the same story. I think I was around 26 and I really, really started to spiral. And at this point, the price of pills was $25, $30 a pill. And for me to get off, it took at least six to eight pills. So do the math, you know what I mean? That's like 250 bucks just for me to get right. Not even be high, but just feel normal. Um, and that's when I switched to heroin. You know, I snorted my first bag of dope and, and I noticed as soon as I felt it hit my system, it felt exactly like it felt when I took that pill in the locker room when I was a kid. The progression from pills to heroin is very simple. Because heroin, especially here in New Jersey, is way too easy to get. You could get like a bag of heroin for like $8. And you're gonna get high even quicker. And it's gonna last longer. And it's cheaper. That's why a lot of kids progress because they're looking for that new ultimate high. Because once you get to be that addict and you get to that certain level, that dose that you're taking isn't getting you to that high that you, that euphoric high that you had. So now you have to go harder and harder and harder. Heroin, what are we even talking about? I remember hearing that word for the first time and be like, no way, dude. Going to URI next year, but then the sickness creeps in. And then you start getting the, hot, the, the cold sweats and you're back in that fetal position and it's, I'm either taking this and doing heroin or I'm gonna have to feel like this. And I did anything to run from that feeling. So I started, I sniffed my first bag of heroin at 17 years old. I sniffed heroin for one week and I became an IV heroin user at 17.
This was like my first lo fishing love on Long Island, dude, this lake. This is where I started my Long Island fishing. I would say throughout like my college, my college years, I just didn't, I didn't do it at all, you know, and little did I know at Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Lake has like musky, which get are giant pike essentially, same yeah. family of fish and they're enormous. I had no idea that was there and obviously I was doing other, preoccupying myself yeah. with other things in college, you know, so. You, you, like, it wasn't even a thing. It wasn't even a thought. But like I had teammates that were like really into fishing. I was like, you're wasting, you could be partying. You know, you could be going to, I would not, I'm not skipping, you know, a mixer with a sorority to go fishing, you know. Can't find my spinner that I want. The goal once you win one is, the equation is however many years you have left, that's how many you wanna win. So I was a true sophomore, I got one knocked off, I got two more years, I'm gonna be a three timer. You know, and obviously I didn't win the next two years. And of course that had something to do with the way I was treating my body and the way I was treating my mind and the way I was living. And it was destructive. The progression of this thing for me was always wrestling kept it in check, right? So having to go to class once in a while, having to go to practice every day, having to make weight, having to compete, these things always kept me in check. That was like my saving grace, right? It didn't like spike out of control until I was done and I had no more eligibility left and I still had a year of school. That's when it got completely out of hand. So he had to wrestle four straight years. When he was done, I said, listen, stick around. I want you to help out, right? You gotta come in. Well, the first umpteen practices, I mean, a couple weeks, we never saw him. And that's when I knew he was really bad. Every day. I drank and I told you earlier, I was, I needed the drugs to function. You know, I couldn't stay awake without them. And then I'd be up all night because of them. You know, I'd gone to the hospital a couple times thinking I was having a heart attack. You know, they told me my blood pressure and my um, pulse rate were absolutely out of control. And they're like, listen, you are, you're, you're gonna have a stroke. You are going to have a serious health consequence for this. And I would go home, I'd calm down. You know, they maybe wrote me a tranquilizer or something, you know, they'd calm down. Same night back at it, as soon as those panicky feelings went away. It was like, it's a drug psychosis at that point when you're losing so much sleep. You've taken way too much of a stimulant and you start like, I guess hallucinating would be the right word. Paranoia does not do it justice. So I always had this like nagging fear of someone breaking into my house. And I remember thinking like, I heard someone coming up my stairs Someone's coming in the house because I remember laying on my floor, peeking out the blinds, turned all the lights off. I remember unplugging my PlayStation because the fan in the back of it was making a noise and I couldn't hear if someone was, you know, coming up the stairs because of the fan. It was just so, it was insane, literally insane. And locking my door and putting a fucking dresser in front of the door, you know what I mean? It was, that was real. The next morning when you were fucking putting the dresser back up the stairs, you, Dude, what are you doing, man? It won't, it'll be different tonight. That insanity, right? No different, worse. Same thing, on repeat, every fucking day. It's not hard on the internet. Hey, Adderall addiction, what do you have? You have paranoia, you have all these. And it was like he checked. <laughs> Just like he checked all the boxes for being a good wrestler, all the boxes for being a good addict. And I had like a Subaru Impreza STI, the fast little rally race car, right? It was awesome. But I would always start tearing it apart when I got, you know, a little wild. I'd start tearing it apart and rebuilding it and putting parts on it and then blow the thing up and build a new engine. And He took his entire car apart. <laughs> Think about this. Think about parts everywhere and he's just sitting up all night, taking Adderall, drinking beer, messing around with his car. Coach Flynn always used to tell me, you are not a fucking mechanic. Stop fucking around with your car. But that was like my obsession when I was, you know, in the throes of this thing. That's when it was glaring. And I mean, I'd alienated every one of my friends at this point. I remember my buddy Mario had straight up, he's a, as straight a shooter as they come. He told me, you are a junkie. And then he didn't call me Gregor anymore, he called me junkie. And this is a stubborn guy. This is. This is a guy that'll hold on to a single leg forever that'll ride you for, you know, 650. You know, he's stubborn and, and um, wow, some, something that you cannot 
say no to and it's it's so much stronger than people realize until you see it you know and you're just like wow can't you just can you it's wrecking you can't you just stop I really got into motivation when I got sober, but I started, uh, you know, reading something. And I came across this quote from Warren Buffett that said, the chains that bind you are too light to feel until they're too heavy to get off of you. You know, you put a chain on you, you put a chain on you, you put a chain on you, and until all of a sudden you don't realize there's too much on you and you're stuck. And uh, that's one of my favorite ways to describe addiction. You know, you start because it feels good. You start because it's fun. And then before you know it, you're stuck and you have no choice and you actually physically need it. And uh, that's the chains that bind you. Yeah, uh, so it got, you know, started tail spinning out. And Coach Flynn was, you know, I wasn't answering his calls at this time, failing classes uh, at this point. You know, we've kind of left this out until now, but uh, I was engaged to a, a girl that was from my hometown. And, and I remember she'd like gone through my phone and found a text to someone about trying to buy some, you know, some of someone else's prescription off of them and um, she basically kind of cut it off, you know, the engagement at that point. I, that's when I broke down. My mom was right there and I started bawling and just fell in my mom's arms and I just told him everything. You know, I, I'm, I have a drug problem. I can't stop doing drugs and I can't stop doing, I can't stop drinking. You know, I'm an, I definitely have a drinking and a, and a drug problem. I can't, I don't know what to do. Becca just left me this, you know, and I fell in my mom's arms and it was like a very, very uh, important moment in my life. And that started my journey of sort of thinking about getting help. I did for about 10 or 11 days. I hadn't gotten bad enough yet. Go to your half, go to your half, go to your half, uh, whistling. You Since 2001, uh, Rowden High School has less, lost 70 kids uh, to overdose and suicide. Most of the suicides were drug related. I lost two wrestlers within a four-day span. We know there's a problem, you know? It's not just a problem in Hazlitt. It's not just a problem in New Jersey. It, it's a nationwide issue. It's, a, it's an epidemic that's kind of taken this country and, you know, it's a freight train. When we look at how did this opioid epidemic come to where it is today, especially here in the United States and across the world, it's been a confluence of multiple things. There was a push back in the 80s and, and 90s for us to recognize pain as a, an additional vital sign. Uh, I think the World Health Organization and other organizations basically were saying, we're under-treating, under-recognizes pain as a condition. Combine that with the pharmaceutical industry having this overzealous kind of campaign to, I don't want to use the word push, but let physicians know, hey, you have this ammunition available to treat these pain issues. And I think a third variable was the, the doctors not being as educated or as sophisticated as they, they should have been in, in possibly um, anticipating the, the, negative out, uh, the negative outcomes that could occur from putting somebody on opioid me uh, medications. So it was a combination of multiple things that led to these prescribed opioid issues. You know, I had a father call me last week and say, Coach, you know, my, my son is in bottom. I mean, he's using, we found needles, and, and, and I, I need your help. You know, we've reached out for, for a few months now, and. It, you can't force somebody to get help. They gotta wanna get help themselves, and unfortunately at this time, um, he doesn't think he has a problem. You know, they need to hit that bottom until they realize uh, they need help, and sometimes that bottom is, is death. I got a, uh, this is a collage I made right after Ryan passed of uh, a lot of the good times we had. Ryan wrestling. Ryan was a real good wrestler, and that's when he was high. I, I honestly believe if Ryan would have continued to train and stayed out of drugs, that he would have went on and wrestled to college at a D1 school, without a doubt. And Ryan um, chose a different path. My name is Oliver Stone. Now I'm the uh, digital marketer for Flow Wrestling. 
when you're in that life of like someone you know is addicted to heroin, you constantly think of this possibility. Constantly. And I've said it to him a hundred times, Zach, I don't want to be the one that finds you. My brother, Zach, he's four years older than me. And he was the first person in my family that got into wrestling. And then I get into it. You see your older brother doing it, you look up to him, you just start doing the same things. A lot of my life ends up doing what Zach did. My mom texted me while I was at the gym. And she goes, Zach's not answering. Can you just check on him? And I open his door, and I see his face down in his bed. And I, I'm like, Zach, and I yell. He doesn't answer. And I turn him over, and throw up comes out, like shoots out. And we had a, a few, they're called Narcan kits. They're what you give people when they're ODing around the house. At that point, I was just like, there's not much else I could do. And I'm, I'm outside, I'm pacing on my porch back and forth. And then a paramedic comes out. He goes, who are you to him? I go, that's my brother. <sighs> so I'm sorry. He didn't make it. I remember I screamed curse words, screamed so loud. And then it sets in. That I gotta call my mom and tell her. I gotta call my dad and tell her. I was assigned to the North Precinct on the desk. I was standing in the supervisor's room and I got the phone call that um, Ryan was at my father's house and he was dead. They found him. on the floor with a needle in his arm. I dropped my phone, dropped to my knees and I started crying. I dreaded that phone call. I knew it was eventually gonna come, but I dreaded that phone call every day. after four months of shooting dope, it was like, where does this go? Like, this goes all the way bad. It's a progressive thing, right? It always gets worse. It never gets plateaued or never gets better, right? It always gets worse. And that's the nature of the beast with this thing. There's only one way it can end up, and a couple, you know, jail, rehab, or dead. Rock bottom for me in addiction was sleeping in my car in a random town in Massachusetts shooting heroin out of puddle water, Gatorade, or Mountain Dew. Doing anything I needed to do to get high that day. Nothing else mattered. Not showing up to work, uh, not having relationships with my family. The only thing that mattered was how am I gonna get 20 bucks to get my next bag to get high. Uh, after about four months of shooting, uh, I lost my job, I lost my girl, and my car got stolen. And that's really what it takes, right? We have to run out of resources. That's when you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you're like, you're not this person. Everything that was important to me had gone. I had no friends left to hang out with. The apartment that I was in, I was having to leave. The girl that I was engaged to had left. That night before I ended up going into rehab, I was in my apartment, the lease had kind of come to an end. I was getting evicted. I think three days later, I had no electricity at this point. It had done everything been turned off because I wasn't paying anything. I'd lost all the money that I had doing nonsense. And I remember doing, doing Adderall that day and drinking, and I just wasn't working anymore. The feelings that were good were no longer. And I remember being in the garage and uh, I remember being on the floor with like a flashlight trying to fix something on the car and I called Coach Flynn, I just had had enough. And I called Coach Flynn, I was just sobbing my eyes out. All I remember is I asked him, I don't know how he got on his weight, he said he weighed 154 pounds or something like that. Well, he wrestled 57, right? Well, he's, you know, at that point, he's just knee deep in Adderall. 
you know, and I'm like, listen, son, you, you need help. I said, you, you hang up the phone and call, or I'm gonna come up and, <laughs> I'm gonna come up and drive you myself. You know, I, there was no need to drag me and I was going on my own accord at that point. I'd had enough. I just knew it was time. All the right side are therapist's office. The left side, we have some rooms here. We have a movie room where during groups we'll show movies. Little lounge that we have. Sometimes families will come. Not a lot because at this level of care, um, remember at this level of care, we are a medical facility with a clinical component. So we're not quite at the point where the families are really interacting with the patients. I call all the families and interact with them. But with the patients, we kind of remember it's medical. We got to get them through this process. Right. When I rolled up to my first treatment center, um, I was beaten, battered, and broken. Uh, I looked like hell. The first feeling that I felt after making the phone call and lining up my admission and like, all right, tomorrow morning you have a bed. The first thing I felt was fear. The fear is, oh my God, what is my life going to be like without the substance that's been helping me cope with life, right? So it's amazing. That little piece of fear keeps people trapped in hell, not knowing that all I got to do is push through that mountain and on the other side is like freedom. So when I went into rehab, and when I said I was gonna start pursuing that program, right, I couldn't imagine not doing it full-fledged. If you know me, right, I'm doing it all the way. So when I decided to do it, I was gonna do it for the rest of my life. When I made that decision, it took a long time to make that decision. It took a lot of kicking and screaming and a lot of unnecessary pain, right? But when I decided to go in, I was going in for good, you know? I knew that this was the end of it, and I said my farewells. And when I went in, I knew that I would have, you know, someday I would have, again, you know, knock on wood, but I knew that I would be an old timer at some, I just, that's the way I'm wired, you know? Just like I said, when I started fighting, I didn't start fighting to win the Ring of Combat local promotion. I'm trying to win a UFC belt. Let's go, three more. Yes, sir. <coughs> two, three, yeah. Take a little more step with that left. Yes, sir. Come in here more. Yeah, right. And the great thing, a great thing, about having an addictive personality, which he does, you know, um, he got addicted to the process of getting better. And now he's addicted to his training. Uh, they say go to 90 meetings in 90 days. And I did 180 meetings in 90 days. That was my, my first 90 days. I did it two a day. And if I only did one, I went to three the next day. I spent time. I wasn't dipping my toe and seeing if I liked it. Cannonballed into it. Honestly, I tell him all the time, especially every anniversary that he has with that, is this is nothing. I mean, that's the fight of your life. That's all it takes is one time. Screw that up, you know, you can fall right back to rock bottom. You met Keith earlier, he tells me to tone it down sometimes because I'm going 100 miles an hour in the right direction. The other side, jail, rehab, dead. You know, I'm really proud of the ability of him to continue and, you know, stay sober, no drinking, no nothing. Especially in, you know, after your fights, everybody's partying, having a good time. You know, that, that's a real strong-minded person. And I couldn't imagine picking a drink back up. It's like it doesn't exist. It's like booze isn't made anymore. Like those drugs aren't, it's just not, it can't be on my menu. Very quickly after my first two weeks of being separated from drugs and alcohol for the first time in seven years, stuff started to kick on. Emotions started to happen. I started to have feelings again. And when we're kind of wrapped in addiction and wrapped in substances, it, you know, it's hard to see the picture when you're the frame. You know, and, and coming at the treatment was kind of that getting that bird's eye view of my life and seeing how truly unmanageable it was. To where he is now is like night and day. I see what he does now and his commitment to being, you know, a professional athlete. 
If we had that, Greg, or I, I have no idea what we, we would have had. I mean, we had a four-time All-American, a guy who won the national. Great flurry. Great execution. Yeah. Wow. He could have been real special. He was really special. So where do we go, right? How do we, how do we help? How do we stop? What do we do? Number one, early education. I go into the schools uh, with a program called Steered Straight, and my biggest thing that I feel the need to say to them is they skip out the part where drugs physically feel good and they're fun, right? We can't just tell them all the bad and not tell them why people continuously use them. Because it's an escape, because it feels good. If you just tell them the tail end of the story and the front end doesn't match up, well then we lost them right with their first drink. If I could talk to my 17 year old self getting rolled out of the hospital and that doctor slapping that prescription on me, I'd probably tell them that it's okay to be who you are and then not have to take a drug every single day to change who you are for either your own approval or somebody else's approval. It's okay to be you. The reality is we're all broken the same. The drugs aren't the problem. They're the solution to the problem. The problem is the way that we feel. The problem is the self-hatred. The problem is the isolation. That's the problem. We talk about the old rat park experiment, right? How the, the rat, you know, would step on the cocaine infused water until it fried from the electric you know grates because the rat wasn't living in a healthy environment but when you incorporated you know positive relationships and positive you know, activities the rats never hit the, the the cocaine infused water they always hit the regular drinking water so it, it really is um, the environment and one's purpose in life that uh, is the antidote to, to addiction. I love my job, but then, you know, you get your failures and you're a wrestler and, you know, you're standing at somebody's casket hugging somebody's mom and you're beating the shit out of yourself thinking, what did I do wrong? The aunts and uncles are all giving me hugs and, like, I tried my best and they're all so grateful at this funeral and I just feel like shit about myself. Why, why did I get through it? Why am I here? The fuck did I do? You know? Why do I deserve this? Is that the attitude? It's still knocking down the... <clears throat> I think, I think, you know, it's a little bit of survivor guilt, a little bit of, you know, battlefield fatigue, you know? Um, I had the Narcan a kid a couple weeks ago. That fucked me up. I don't know how long I could really do this to the capacity that I'm doing it. Right now, this is where I'm supposed to be, you know, and, and I know it. I know I'm living my purpose, but it fucking beats the shit out of you, dude. It really does. As a wrestling coach at Raritan High School, I've lost seven. Seven in 20 years. It, it doesn't get easier. It's not my job burying former wrestlers. And, and you know, it's, it's tough. We've been pretty successful here at Raritan. But when you hear a success story of somebody that was using and then all of a sudden get clean, th those are the biggest victories. I mean, I, you know, to me as a coach, when you see a kid struggle and hit bottom and make a comeback and then start preaching their, their message and telling their, their story to, to future students and future wrestlers, that's what it's all about. It's like you can go from being, well, you know, my friend Mario was calling me a junkie, to being 13 and 0 in the UFC. I'll tell you what's even more important than that was that my parents trusted me. You know what I mean? And someone, my friend Manny upstairs, would trust me to babysit his daughters when they go out. That's way more important than winning fights or winning belts. The trust from your friends, the reliability. <laughs> Being able to say no, not saying yes and then lying about why you weren't doing it, those things mean so much, you know. 
So the lesson that I want you know people to take from this is that no matter how far you've gone in the wrong direction, because I was pretty far. I'd gone, you know, in that point in my life was very far down, right? Um, you can always go back the other direction. Every little teeny turn your life takes leads you to where you're at, and I'm very happy. I live a cool life, man. I can't, no complaints. I get to fish on the weekends, and I get to fight during the week. Yeah, so. Sweet, man. Cool. You guys feel good?